So everyone, today is Thursday, May 7, 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all of you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking the effort to be here lately. It just seems like we just get the people from the Facebook group because I've been having some technical difficulties with GoToWebinar, and it's mostly my user error. So sorry about that. But if you register now, you should, or any time over the next few weeks, today's May 7th again, you should be registered for at least until early next year. So hopefully I've got that kink worked out. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, that's pretty much the focus of the show today. Obviously your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them focused to the slides and that's just for your benefit. So my ADD doesn't kick in. And also when we get to the live charts, you can ask me anything you want, but if you want to ask about individual stocks, wait till we get to the live charts for that. So what are we talking about? Well, I want to continue my discussion on the overall market. I think that's kind of the elephant in the room. So basically, if you attended last week, a lot of things we talked about last week, I want to talk about again this week. There's a few new things that have developed. As a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I still have from Greg Morris. I've been doing bear market updates with the market kind of choppy and sideways lately. I haven't put out as many updates, but if you go to my website and click on that, you should get a list of the latest articles and also check the home page too. Okay, one thing I've been looking at lately is the fact that volatility has really begun to come off in the market. If you look at the line on the bottom chart, that is the 50 day historical volatility. And it's kind of shocking to me to see the S&P 500 at an HV of 70. And as I often preach, in order to beat the market, especially short to intermediate term, you, as a general statement, need to be trading stocks with an HV that is higher than the overall market. Now, there's some exceptions here and there, especially on the short side. If you capture an inefficient move in an efficient stock, something like an insurance company coming off of all-time highs or a big stodgy big cap stock coming off of all-time highs, then that volatility expands in your favor. Now, what's interesting is how this curve, if you want to call it that, has begun to flatten out. It looks like hopefully with the virus curve, will soon become. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, there's quite a few things that are gonna happen as this volatility begins to implode. Now, obviously, if we have a big old rally or a big old sell-off, the, the volatility will stay where it is. Also, you can't time off of volatility in and of itself, but it is still useful. So if we see a false breakout one way or the other, as volatility begins to dry up in here, and we see an expansion of volatility. When we get to the live charts, you'll see that volatility is running about 40% of what it normally does. And I'll show you that when we get to the live charts. So we could get an expansion of volatility soon in here, but as a general statement, it will die out or it is dying out longer term. And if you think about it, we're taking some of those big slides off and we're adding in the sideways action. So that's gonna come down quickly. The option prices should begin to come off as the volatility begins to drop. Option prices or the implied volatility is what the option market is implying and the historical volatility is what the market actually is. So implied volatility, I guess you could look at that as sort of forward looking and you would expect that to begin to come off as the historical volatility or statistical volatility, easy for me to say, begins to come off. So just kind of an interesting observation. I'll have a lot more to say about this in upcoming shows as it continues to develop. If you go back a couple of weeks, as you know, we were looking at whether or not you could time off of volatility. And it does show some promise, but when you if you look at the trees for the forest, you'll see that those spikes of volatility, which come with bottoms and the drying up of volatility or the 
low volatility, which often comes with tops, those don't line up in quite a perfect way. And one of the things that I did point out was that volatility could suck you into a bit of a rabbit hole. And it's something that I think is, is worth studying, but like anything, don't try to make it a holy grail. Use it to help put the pieces together. Now, one thing that's been interesting in here, as volatile as the market seems lately, it's actually began, or it actually has begun, to calm down quite a bit. And if you look at the closing price today, or the live price as of now, and then you look back for several weeks, you can see that we're relatively unchanged. Now, remember, statistical volatility is based on the closing prices, the changes of the closing prices. So that's gonna to continue to come off as long as we stay mostly sideways in here. So one thing of interest is that we are developing a trading range. Now a trading range, although it's not great for a trend follower, it does give you some structure to work around. So if you take the bottom of the range, circa let's say 2700 and the top of the range let's say 20 oh i don't know 2950 or so somewhere around that 3000 and as far as a uh, technical term anything above that area would be good right anything below this area would be not good now you're probably thinking well like <laughs> pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker this is pretty captain obvious everybody knows that well it's good to see and sometimes you don't see it sometimes you get a little caught up in the bullishness and the bearishness and you forget about the sideways sidewaysness <laughs> so we can see that we are developing a range that does give you kind of a, a structure to work around so to speak now if you think about it if you drop below the range this is where classical technical analysis can help out a little bit i've often said if you're you know, do study classical technical analysis schaubach or pring schaubacher meaning one of the older classics from the i guess 30s and 40s and then edwards and mcgee actually had a friend that met one of those guys edwards or mcgee and he was very happy to have somebody that was Flattered and he was flattered to have somebody come meet him, but that's another story altogether. Anyway, long story endless, study all that classical technical analysis, study more modern classics such as Pring and Murphy, but don't try to use it all and just use the the parts that that make a lot of sense from a standpoint of what's happening on a psychological basis. I I can't wrap my head around something like a diamond formation. If somebody can explain to me from a psychological standpoint why that makes sense, then maybe I can wrap my head around it. And then the other thing is, how do you time off of it? You know, so that type of stuff, hard to implement, but something like support and resistance in a trading range makes a lot of sense. So where I'm going with this is if the market drops below 2,700, then anything above 2700 to 29 let's say 50 or the top of this range is likely to be seen as overhead supply and that means that anybody who was a little late to this game coming off the bottom and is just buying in recently because the market just goes up right okay other than that little spill we had back in february in March, other than that, the market just goes up, right? So anybody who bought during this range might be looking to get out and break even. And it's just human nature. And that's what I'm kind of hinting at with this classical technical analysis, especially things like support and resistance. Go in and read all those books and learn all those things, but then be really careful when you go to implement them. And by the way, I used to see somebody blog and every day they would put out a post and they would use a different form of technical analysis in their post. And if you look at enough technical analysis, you could probably find enough to confirm or deny what you may or may not be thinking. And a lot of the stuff he used was wrong because every now and then he used some of my stuff and he would totally get it wrong. So the point is, don't try to use all of it. Find something simple and stick with it. Net, net price change, very, very, very important and very commonsensical if that's a word to use so use things like that 
don't try to use all of technical analysis all of the time. In fact, even better, just find a little bit that makes sense to you. Something, say, trend following in nature, net net price change, and possibly a moving average or two, and go from there. Now, one thing that I've been concerned about lately is that the market has a big picture retrace look to it. Now, it's not the end of the world, and obviously, if we get above that 3,000 round number, which would get us above this little trading range, as I just said, things would certainly begin to improve, but this does have me a little bit concerned, and as I've been saying quite a bit, and I'll touch upon towards the end of the presentation once more, the newly minted quarantine traders who started buying in late March had this tailwind behind them, a hurricane wind behind them for the most part, and trading has turned out to be pretty easy. When that begins to subside, and when all the bottom fishers who bought a few weeks ago or a month ago or so, when the market begins to slide a little bit, then they have to rethink their positions. And other people will have to rethink too. My friend that I was saying was making so much money, it's 401k, he questioned his day job. He's gotten a lot of his money back. And, but I think he's shaken a little bit because He's a little bit older than me, or my age at least, and he's trying to figure out a plan for retirement. He's worked really hard all his life, saved his money like crazy, and now he's kind of rethinking everything. So, because he lost more in that slide than he probably would have made adding to his 401k over the next five years or so, whatever he wants to retire. So, anyway, a lot of hard decisions to be made by a lot of people if we begin to roll over. As I've been saying quite a bit, Borrowing an adage I stole from Linda Rasky, I borrowed from Linda Rasky, who she borrowed from somebody else when I asked her. The market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people. And the market will also do the most obvious thing, the most unobvious man. I know I repeat that every week. The most obvious thing, at least back in March, was a new leg lower. The most unobvious thing would be a leg higher first and then roll back over. And if you think about the market doing what it has to do to punish the most amount of people, how many times have you been shaken out of a fantastic position only to watch it take off without you? I'm raising both my hands now, and I nearly got shaked and shaken out of a couple this morning. Now, one thing of concern still, and I'm gonna continue to follow the signal for you because these major weekly signals are very important, and I think it pays to pay attention. Not every signal will turn into the mother of all bear markets or bull markets, depending on the signal you're looking at. But every major bear market or every major bull market will have one of these signals that I can guarantee. And that's why, as I often say, beating a dead horse here, that Greg Morris points out that they, back when they were running much, a bunch of money, take all signals seriously. They treat all signals as if it will become the big one. So we did have this bow tie down on a weekly basis. And you can see we've had the sharp retrace, as you know. Now an aggressive entry would be here above 2,800. And a less aggressive entry would be around, let's say 2,700 or so. Now, what's interesting is I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, don't, I didn't think this thing triggered because I was looking at stockcharts.com, which I think uses a calendar weekly chart, meaning that Friday to Friday, right? Whereas Telechart uses a rolling five day period. Neither one is right or wrong. I think all the classical technical analysis is built off of a calendar chart versus a rolling five-day period. And I think both have their uses. And I think you could end up splitting hairs if you look at it too closely. But the bottom line is the daily chart based on a rolling five-day period did not trigger. So if you take a look at Telechart, which, is uses, which uses a rolling period, you can see that we made higher highs and higher lows ever since the March bottom. So if you were trading a pullback vis-a-vis -vis something like the weekly bow tie, that would not have triggered 
based on that. And that's why you probably want to use something like a little bit somewhere between an aggressive entry and a less aggressive entry to avoid some of the possible whips on here. And then it also, it'll wash out with a weekly, on a calendar week basis versus a weekly on a rolling week basis. So just to, just to kind of close the loop on that. So let's say you're looking today at Telechart or another chart package that uses a five-day rolling period, then you would look that weekly would have last Thursday's prices to this Thursday's prices in there, as opposed to you start building a new week on Monday, and then that week ends on Friday. So calendar versus rolling calendar might be a better way of putting it. Now, I went through all this last week and many other weeks, but let me just get through it real quickly. The TFM 10% system, we're looking at the 52-week closing high, and we're seeing how far the market is away from that 52-week closing high. So this blue line on top, as the market makes new closing highs, it goes higher and higher and higher. And you could see that the histogram up top would be 0% because you are right at that 52-week closing high. And obviously, when you get to pull back from it or sell off from it, the histogram begins to grow because you're dropping from those highs. But until and unless you make new closing highs, the line will remain flat. And if we go 50 weeks without making a new closing high, then the line will begin to drop. Now, the premise that I have is if a market is going to lose 50% of its value, if a market is going to lose half of its value, it's going to lose 10% first. Well, that's just technical analysis 101. That's the first thing you need to learn in technical analysis, A, B, C. If a market is going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B along the way, right? So based on that, the system just says, okay, if we close below the 50-week moving average and we are 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high, then we need to GTFO. It's a he who fights and runs away type of system. Okay, we lost 10% of our money. From the highs, at least, if we were in going back, oh, I don't know, a year or so ago, where did, when did the last trigger on the upside? It turned bullish last February. So that was a pretty good run, but then you gave up a big piece of that. But it's better than losing all of that, right? So that's the sell in and of itself. The buy, you have to get back above the 50-day moving average, and you actually have to have two lows above that 50-day moving average, or 50-week moving average in this case. You also have to be above the buy line, which is within 10% of the 50-week closing high. So the buy would mean that we'd have to have two lows above that, and we would also have to be above the buy line, okay? So just a close above the buy line is all you need, plus two lows above the 50-week moving average. So that's the whole system in and of itself, pretty simple stuff. These are results. I wanted to just update them last week and just show you just a couple things real, real quick. If you compare it to buy and hold, eh, it really didn't blow buy and hold away. And this is just going back to 1988. I could go back further and I think these numbers are going to look a lot better. I started doing that. I just, there's so much going on. There's not going to be time to finish it anytime soon, but I can tell right away but those numbers are gonna look a lot, lot better when you put in some big drawdowns of the past. Now, even looking at these mediocre numbers, 1,026% versus 936%, okay, based on $10,000 over these 30 years or so. And again, it didn't beat the pants off fine hole, but you did avoid a 28% drop recently, which if we go right back up, you'll say, well, it's just a do-over, who cares? Well. If it's a 50% or 40% drop like we saw in 2000 and 2003, 
then that's a little bit bigger of a deal as I've been preaching, especially if you were going into retirement and then you lost half of your money. And then you gotta think, well, do I keep working? Do I do I get that single wide trailer versus that double wide I had my eyes on? You know, you have to make some you have to make some hard decisions. And the beauty of any type of market timing that's conceptually correct, okay, and simple, is that you occasionally move, miss out on or avoid a really, really ugly move like we had back in the 20s and 30s. Now, one of the points here, notice that you're out of the market about 21% of the time. So out of those 31 plus years, 25 plus years, you were out of the market, which is pretty cool. I mean, you might have a little FOMO. You might be having some FOMO right now if you're following some sort of simplified market timing, but at least you're able to sleep at night when you come in and the futures are down 100 points overnight, P futures, that is. So if you take a look at the late 20s, early 30s, obviously you had a sell signal when the market dropped 10% below its 50 week closing high and also closed below its 50 week moving average. And then the market lost about 80% or so. It was at uh, 40, I'm sorry, 26 and change, I think. And it went down to 4.4 or something like that. So that's a, that's a pretty serious move to avoid using some sort of market timing. Now, a premise I've been kind of noodling with lately and I haven't quantified it, nor do I maybe need to even quantify it. But once something turns red or bearish, in this particular case, now bearish here is just you are 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. Neutral would be 10% or more above, away from the 50-week closing high, but above the 50-week moving average. And then bearish would mean you're back below that 50-week moving average and more than 10% away from the 50 week closing high. In other words, if you're below the green line and you are below the moving average on a closing basis, it's bearish. It's neutral if you are either above the 50 week moving average and still below the 10% line or within above the buy line and below the 50 week moving average. So bearish means you're under a sell signal. Neutral means that you could be, you could have half a sell signal one way or the other or half a buy signal. And if it's green, obviously you're under a buy signal. Now, the premise that I've been kind of noodling with is when things begin to get bad, they often get worse. And when things get good, they get better sometimes, right? So I often joke, it's often dark right before it gets more dark. So obviously going back and looking at this bullish versus bearish, again, bullish would mean you're above the buy line and you're also above the 50 week moving average the lows are above the 50 week moving average. In other words, you have daylight or Landry light above the 50 week moving average. So notice here, it closed below the 50 week moving average, but you were still above the buy line, okay? So that would be like a bit of a warning sign. And then, oops, never mind, it went straight back up the following week, okay? So it went neutral here. Same thing back here, except that it didn't close below the 50 day moving average, but it price intersected it. So you didn't have Landry light back here, so it went neutral, okay? And then I don't know if you can see any charts at home or your screen at home, but here you're below the buy line and you're below the 50 week moving average. You have closed below, so you can see it was still red back here. Went neutral for a while as, you be, as the market rallied above the buy line, still below the moving average, and then it went bullish when you had two weeks where the lows were greater than the moving average and you were above the buy line. And again, as I've said quite often, I was still pretty bearish in the market back here in March of, I think that's 2019, 
and I didn't think that we would see any bias signals for a while. And somebody pointed out in the group, Facebook group, hey, Dave, you got a bias signal. I'm like, no, 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 you silly little bull. There's no way. And then lo and behold, it was. So that's the advantage of having something like this. Not that you want to follow it mechanically, but it does give you a point of reference. It does give you a piece of the puzzle to help keep you on the right side of the market and maybe more importantly or as importantly to keep you become from becoming obstinate so right now i'm probably still bearish i hate to label myself but i'm probably still bearish although i'm seeing a buy signal here and there in individual issues a setup in individual issues by the way do the market timing but let the database tell you what to do okay but i know that i have some longer term systems that are still bearish in here and maybe I need to take that into consideration before I go on a buying spree, okay? And I certainly don't want to rush out and buy the overall market while these longer term systems are still negative. Maybe I'll play an opening gap reversal here and there, but for the most part, I don't want to hold the market longer term until things improve. So the big $64,000 question is, we've been bearish for a while based on this system, okay? So will that bearishness beget more bearishness? Or will the negative beget more negative? Will the dark become more dark? So the long as, longer it, whatever it may be that you're looking at, Landry Light or the, let's say, weekly moving averages, or insert your favorite market timing system or trend following system, but the longer it stays bullish, the longer it stays bullish, and the longer it stays bearish, the longer it stays bearish. And again, I don't know if we can quantify this It's how long is long, right? But it, it has been a little red here for a while, as you know. Now, we showed this last week, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But this is just 50-week Landry light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. The histogram up top just counts the number of days. And again, we were green. We stayed green for a while. We stayed red for a while. Then we stayed red a while longer. We stay green for a while, then we stay green for quite a while longer. Red and then red for quite a while. You use major bull and bear markets, you can see up top. And then again, green tends to beget more green. And there's a little red here and there. And that red should not be completely ignored as I preach. Because 2015, 2016, that little slide we had in there was not very pretty. And it was a tough time to be a trend follower. And if you held through that, shame on you. Shame. In 2018, that little slide was darn ugly, right? Okay. And then obviously we're, we have a little red now. So we have to, we have to pay attention to this. And I'm not an asset alligator or an asset gatherer. <laughs> Sarcasm implied. Sarcasm is my favorite, my second, second favorite as of my first is enthusiasm, of course. But if you are holding on to your retirement and this little rally presents itself, especially with these longer term signals still in effect, it might be a good time to possibly sell down to the sleeping level and you have to make those hard decisions yourself. So again, how long for red begets more red? Now, here, here's the weekly bow ties. And as I discussed last week, it's mostly green in bull markets and mostly red in bear markets, which kind of interesting is there was no green in the 2000 bear market with the weekly bow ties. And there was no green in the 2007, 2008 bear market, which I find kind of fascinating. And then the run since we've had a couple of little red periods in there, a couple of little cautious periods. The last bow tie down in 2000 and 18 did not trigger and the reason it didn't trigger was because the market had a v-shaped recovery before it could trigger and 
depends on whether you're looking at a calendar weekly or a rolling weekly right now. But for all intents and purposes, we really hadn't a trigger. We hadn't had a trigger yet in that weekly bow tie. But going back in history, there's been some really ugly bear markets that have happened after a weekly signal. So we're not out of the woods yet, but hey, let's hope the market goes back up. Let's make some new highs. Let's get out of this mess that we're in. Now, as I said earlier, is the most pain unfolding? Well, the most pain would be for the market to roll back over. Now the shorts have been squeezed out and the longs have been sucked in. So as I said last week, the buying hope has been rewarded. I still am of the belief, as I said a few seconds ago, that it's probably still a good time to consider lightening up, but that's based on your own personal situation. If you were looking to retire anytime soon, or sometime soon, I should say, now might be a good time to lighten up, or certainly, in the back of your mind, have an uncle point where you would get back out. As I would say quite a bit, I've been hearing a lot of things, even as little as, as I've been getting out lately. The shoeshine boys abound. The shoeshine boys are when the shoeshine boys start telling you about buying stocks. Obviously, there's no shoeshine boys around, but the kids working the convenience store who are looking to trade stocks people who are mortgaging their house to trade stocks because they're bored in quarantine. It just seems like there's this speculative interest coming into the market. The shorts have been punished. I have that t-shirt. And then the other thing to think about is that market timing can be slow, especially with the moving averages. V-shaped recoveries with market timing are hard to catch. And as a general statement, the market is still pretty overbought. You go back and look at those weekly charts, we're still overbought, even with the last couple of weeks of sideways trading. So I think it's still a dangerous time to just randomly buy in. Now, one thing that I said last week, and I don't want to keep repeating this, is that it's a little perverse, but as a momentum guy, you're supposed to always go after momentum, always go after momentum, always go after momentum. and and for the most part, that's true. But when you have these recoveries, especially if this turns into the mother ball of V-shaped recoveries, the leaders which led us out of this mess, biotech would be a good example, certain communication stocks like Zoom and other ones, probably won't be the leaders for the next leg up, okay? Dave, what will be the leaders? I don't know. Maybe energy, okay? Maybe something that's at lower levels. What happens is, and it can be a little perverse, but what happens is the old leaders, those stocks that are at new highs now, can become a source of funds when the market does make that bona fide new uptrend. And by source of funds, I mean that the companies, the Asset managers, they go in and they sell those companies to raise capital to buy stocks that are coming up from lower levels. What's interesting is value stocks can actually become momentum stocks. Commodity stocks can become momentum stocks when they're coming off of major, major lows. And so those might be the new leaders emerging. I would not bottom fish there just yet. I am seeing one or two or three cheapy, cheapy, cheapy energy stocks that are beginning to set up on the long side. I wouldn't rush out and start buying these just yet though. Now, as I've been saying quite a bit, although I still think we had the potential to roll back over, although we do have a little structure to work within that little range, as usual, I need to continue to believe in what I see and not and what I believe. So as I said last week, just real quick, a lot of people who still might need money while we're waiting on this thing to open back up might be inclined to cash out if the newly minted quarantine traders, and hey, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're just getting in the markets, God, God bless you, that's fantastic, come on in. Just make sure you learn a little bit about money management 
and learn that markets go up and markets go down. And then this is left over from a couple of weeks ago, but more events to happen. Let's hope there's no more events to happen, but we are still sort of in an event-driven environment where things are still a little fragile. And unfortunately, as we start to open back up, I'm not confusing the issue with facts, don't get me wrong, but you know, there might be another wave, but hey, you know, if that wave is not as bad as everybody fears, then that would be obviously a positive event. So there's events. When I say events, I don't mean negative events. I mean both positive and negative events could flow into the market. I think a lot of damage has been done. There's a lot of liquidity left to unwind. I guess that would be a little bit more of a bearish type of argument there. And then uh, there's some artificial buying going on from people who possibly mortgage their house to buy into the market. So anyway, just some random thoughts left over. So if you are a member of DaveLander.com, you have to be a gold member, make sure you join Dave Lander Trend Traders, interact with other traders. I've loved this group so much, I really do. And I was thinking just this morning, it's like, let me just pop in there and see what's going on. Let's see what everybody else is thinking. It, it really helps to have additional eyes on the market and additional thoughts. And as I've said before, I've I've come, not that I'm the grand poobah or anything, but I've come in and said, hey, you know, what about this stock? And, and you guys have kind of shot it down a little bit and stopped me from doing something that I might have been feeling a little bit of that intuition as opposed to the intuition when it comes to a trade. And the beauty is we can ask for help and we can ask each other for help. And to my amazement, a lot of the questions from the newbies are being asked before I can answer them. So thank you guys for that. And then we have the learning management system too to help fill in, on, fill in all the holes. And you can see signs and signals along the way. And occasionally I will mention some trades that I'm seeing, such as the opening gap reversals. Those haven't worked out fantastic lately, but longer term, I think they will. So more information on that, you can go to DaveLander.com, become a better trader with these three things. The If you're listening to a podcast of this, see the actual recording for the for the url or daylander.com slash members m-e-m-b-e-r-s for more information all right let's pop to the live charts let me uh, shift gears here you guys can start asking about individual stocks let's take a look at the live charts and then we'll get to your stock picks in here we should have plenty of time this week to get to everything all right s&p 500 Obviously, decent day today. It's like I was kind of amazed when I went to put in the results for the TFM 10% system. I noticed that, wait a minute, the system looks better than buy and hold over the last week. And I'd forgotten that if we go back about a week or so, we're actually lower than where we were a week ago. In fact, we just take a look at a at a weekly chart, you can see that now not as much as it was earlier this morning, but still lower nonetheless. So top of this range again up here, and let me just give you that number, which I'm sure you have in your own charts. So that is, we can just do this, I guess, 29.60 round numbers. So decent day of the P's, a little bit of a lap open. Let's take a look at the spider real quick. So we lapped open today and really didn't dip much so far so good we're hanging on to that lap okay because it overlaps the prior range it would have to be above this high to be a gap obviously and it's kind of interesting we still hadn't made back last friday's loss but we're working on it okay we're getting there but you can see that so far we've worked our way higher Let's take a look at the moving averages. The bow tie moving averages have crossed over to the upside. I'm not going to call this a bow tie because I like the bow ties to be nice and tight like they were back here. A nice little sell signal. Plus, the other thing, too, is we're coming off of, yeah, it's a couple of year lows. But if you take a look at like the S&P 500 and take a look at like a longer chart. You can see that it's about a couple of year lows. It's not like a 13 year low like we had down here, okay? So I would consider that a much more important signal. Plus, as I said a second ago, 
the bow ties are a little sloppy in here. So you took, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's not like Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. <laughs> 20 something days to flip over as opposed to three or four days as it did back here. Okay. Yeah, keep the picks coming. That's some, that's some, I recognize most of those so far. So it's a P500. I still think we're in a big old fat retrace rally, but hey, one day at a time. Now, I'm not a big fan of measuring retraces, okay, but we have gotten past the 50% retracement. Larry Williams pointed out that usually after 50% retracement, markets have bottomed out. And again, I keep saying I need to go back in and watch that research. But one thing that I did see is you don't always know that this is the bottom when you're measuring that retrace. So if you look at like the 1920s, go back and look at the slides or rewind this presentation, and you'll see that first wave up was a 50% retracement and that was not a bottom in the market. The other thing too is, you might not have a representative sample, meaning enough statistical op observations, but if you are looking for some glimmer of hope, I do think that there's probably something there that certainly that's a, something you would put in a positive column. I wouldn't use it as a signal in and of itself, or complete signal in and of itself, I should say. But, you know, market's working its way higher. So far, so good there. And again, kind of a little range bound shorter term, hard to see all zoomed in like this. But if you zoom it out a little, you can see that we've kind of just chopped back and forth in here for a little while. And you can always use your C key to see, okay, we're a little bit higher than we were back on the fourth, obviously a little bit lower than we were, percent and a half back on, was that last Friday or so? So as usual, one day at a time. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ has had the mother of all retraces and look at that. Looks like it's going to try to lead us out of this mess. We are breaking above recent highs in here. So that's certainly a good thing. So far, so good. My big deal is, and I don't want to come across as a Grinch or anything, but when you have these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, by the time the market, gets, the market gets all the way back to its old highs, it's very, very, very overbought and very, very, very hard to sustain. I'd actually prefer if this market just bottomed out for a while. It took a long time to bottom out and then began to take off just because that type of move higher is a little bit more sustainable. But, you know, the deal, one day at a time and more importantly or as importantly, one setup at a time. And again, we're starting to see some longs and we're starting to get long. I am long one or two IPOs, one for sure. I'm long one of these little speculative stocks too. So not many shorts left and a few longs beginning to creep into my portfolio. So watching the database is important. We'll get a taste of that looking at some of, some of your stock picks here in just one second. So a little bit different picture in the rusty, you can see a big slide and not quite as impressive of a retrace. And let's measure it from this high here. Again, I, I wouldn't use that F word, and that's not um, not fundamentals, but the other F word. So we did get a little bit past 50%, but as you can see, we dropped right back down. So I'm not sure if you could time off of that, at least shorter term, because we did make back 50% of the slide, but then now we're back below that 50% level in the Russell 2000. But I think it's an inter it's I think it's a very interesting observation nonetheless, and I think that anyone could shoot holes in my stuff too. You know, I'm not trying to shoot holes in it. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. Most of the stocks sectors, such as the overall market, are in these retrace rallies. There's a few exceptions, such as gold. You can see banging out new highs. I'm really not seeing a whole lot of gold setups because the take a look at that gold commodity. It really didn't break out decisively above these little peaks in here. I'd like to see a big old breakout and not look back for a while. But yeah, certainly we could see some gold stocks setting up fairly soon. There's a speculative one here or there. By speculative, I mean low price and high volatility. Of course, everything right now is pretty much high volatility. A lot of areas, again, 
especially like the foods have that retrace rally look to them. And then of course, I would just guess if we take a look at like a weekly chart, yeah, weekly bow tie is still working there. But some areas obviously have improved considerably, such as the drugs and biotech. My only concern here, that V-shaped recovery problem rears its ugly head. And you can see biotech made it to brand new highs, came back in and now it's put, having another push. Now on an individual basis, they might there might be a stock here or there that's worthwhile within drugs, biotech, and then health services, you can see big, deep retracement so far, been working its way higher. Now, if you're new to my methodology and you're studying some of the other things, you would say, well, Dave, don't you, would you call some of this a first thrust and all? It's like, well, a first thrust or a bow tie, I like those patterns coming off of major, major lows, especially after the market's bottomed out for a while, as opposed to a V-shaped recovery at high levels. Retail's done amazingly well in here, all things considered, right? So believe in what you see, not in what you believe. And then what else? Semiconductors have also done fairly well, but then they had a little stumble recently. And you can see, this is amazing. Look at that, 79 is your HV there. And what did they drop over like a couple days? They dropped 8% over just a few days, okay? So this kind of exemplifies how fragile this market is. And even though the volatility has come off overall, a lot of areas are still pretty darn volatile. 8% drop followed by whatever that little rally is. 8% drop followed by a 5% rally over a few days. That's, that's pretty crazy and volatile. One more thing real quick, and then we'll get to your questions and stock picks. Earlier, remember when I said, so HV up around 69, as of yesterday, now it's like 68. If you take a look at the six-day HV and you divide that by the 50-day HV, you can see that HV is running about 40%. So that might be, that curve flattening in the volatility might be what you're seeing as price begins to kind of flatten out in here. So shorter term, we are going a little sideways in here, although it still looks like this rally from low is intact. But if you look at the micro a little bit, we are going sideways. The other thing too, especially with the volatility dropping off like this, is if we begin again to drop below this range, especially if we get a fake out to the upside first and drop below this range, then Everybody who was feeling pretty comfortable in that ride higher is going to be a hurt and pup. And then they're also going to think about getting out at that overhead supply. And of course, the shorts who are just chomping at the bit to get back in will probably come back in earnest. Okay. Let's take a look at some of your stock picks. Ed says, hey, Dave. What do you think about PD? I know you don't like breakouts, but on a daily bow tie, daily bow tie and breaking out. Also, if you could you briefly review the ogre methodology of time prevents. Yeah, we should have time for both of those things. Sure. Okay. Well, PD, yeah, it's breaking out, but it looks like we talked about this last week. You have a lot of overhead supply to deal with, okay? So that's my big concern there. Anybody who bought in this area might be looking to get out at break even. Now, one thing I'm kind of torn with is, is everything I learned over the last 30 something years versus everything that's happening right now, okay? It's like, has something changed? Is something different? Can the market just ignore all this classical technical analysis? And I think you can answer that question either way, yes and no. Yes, this market has defied gravity in some ways, defied logic, as it often does, of course. But defied logic is for as you should, this market should be seeing some resistance up in this area here. But is this, is the new, the newly minted quarantine traders, the retail traders who have just jumped in the market, are they just going after everything and 
with enough vigor to push through overhead supply and all? I don't have the answer to that question, but for now, until proven otherwise, I think I'm going to stick with my classical technical analysis and my patterns, okay? So for me to get excited about PD, it would have to push through this overhead supply. Now, as far as the opening gap reversal, so I'll show you one of my favorite examples here, especially since it goes with the trend. So what happens on an open knee gap reversal usually is some sort of bad news flows into the market and there's a big panic on the open and the everybody rushes to get out the door at the same time and provided you're not already long the market, you know, but you could a lot of times you can come in and take advantage of this predicament and Back in the day, you could say it was the market makers, but I guess we still have market makers today. But like the floor market maker, when all these orders come in, he's got to lower, he's got to sell you that stock. So he's going to lower the price to a point where it's an absurd value because he's got to feed his family too. And he's going to flip out those shares later in the day at a higher level. So when you're when you're trading an opening gap reversal, in a sense, you're on the same side as the market maker. So in a case like this, you had a stock that has persisted higher day after day after day. So again, this stock has persist persisted higher. Remember we talk about persistency quite a bit. It means that the stock has the ability to go up day after day after day after day after day. It has this nice little orderly pullback, okay? Could be a little bit deeper, but looks pretty good, okay? I wouldn't rush out and trade it, and this wasn't on my Landry list or anything because the pullback wasn't deep enough. It's also a pretty thick stock, and in general, I don't go after stocks that are super thick like this unless I really, really like to set up. But that could actually be a good thing when it comes to opening gap reversals because it's a crowded playing field, and you might have an institution that wants to own this company, and they just can't go in and start buying it as it's going up because they're they're buying might even push that stock higher, but they can buy when it's on sale. Now this isn't to say that you should rush out and catch a falling knife. What we're doing is we're watching that stock open, and on intraday it might look like this. It opens, let's say it closes up here the prior day, then it opens somewhere down here, and then say this is an intraday chart. Say it does this for a while. And then when it takes out that opening range, okay, that's when you look to buy for a day trade. Now, this is the mother of all examples. And what you do, you would put a stop down here, but as this begins to move in your favor, you do two things. One, you trail the stop higher, and then two, you take partial profits somewhere. Now, by the time you take partial profits, you should be at least at break even, and then you could actually apply some of the longer term trend following techniques we use, like the widening of the stop. So let's say you had a, I'll just pull a number out the air, a two point trailing stop. Well, maybe you open up to three in order to ride out, hopefully, what turns into the mother of all trend days. Now, this is the mother of all examples, right? Okay, 10 points in one day. It's not always that fantastic, believe me. Okay. And then, Lately, they haven't. They seem. They don't seem to be as great as they have been in the past. So that's an opening gap reversal. I just remembered that we kind of beat the dead horse, and you have access to the members area. If you go through the Q and A, that's where a lot of the new material, the new content that will find its way into the learning management system exists. So go through the Q and A, and we covered ogres quite a bit. Let me look for that real quick, and then. Keep those questions coming. We haven't done a Q and A section session lately, but if you come into the Q and A, you can see we did quite a few of them in the past. We have a couple pages of them, and then we could do a search for ogres. Let's see what we get. Yeah, look, we did one back in November on ogres, back in September on ogres, back in August. So we did a lot on those. And if you look at these Q&As, you're like, well, this guy's just all over these ogres. That's all he does. Like, no, it's just a case where there's so, there's so many questions on them that a lot of time is spent on that.
And by the way, to those who are wondering, somebody newer to the methodology and newer to the members area is like, well, how often do you do, you do a Q&A? We were doing them every two weeks, but right now we're getting all the questions answered in Facebook. And we've answered a lot of questions like the opening gap reversal. So we were kind of caught up on that. And when I receive enough questions to do another session, we'll obviously do another session. Okay. GNMK, that's one. I, the, the, there's one I failed on uh, an opening gap reversal, just an FYI. Let's see what's going on. Is this one? Yeah. See, th it wasn't the perfect setup, but on this day here, you had the gap lower. And then I tried to play that rally back up and it just didn't work out. But I like the fact, and you know, it's kind of interesting too. And, and I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> you're probably like, you're probably thinking, dude, it sounds like you're always thinking out loud. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but what's kind of interesting is if you look at, it's one thing that I'm always kind of doing this introspection in this business. Basically, it's a business of introspection, okay? You, you could always do better than you did. And you're always striving to be better. And I noticed that when I'm excited, when I'm kind of uh, mediocre on a trade, not excited about a trade, but it, it has some of the elements that make it look really, really great, but it's not quite perfect. I tend to not do well in those trades. And if I, one thing I've been monitoring or one thing that's been helping me to monitor things is when I put out a post on Facebook and if my post is like, hey, this looks really good, then usually I make money on it. If my post is like, hey, uh, the gap could be better, but it looks okay in a case like this, this GNMK, then it's like I don't tend to do as well on those trades, okay? Now, as far as a new setup, I don't really see it at this juncture. I would like to see it actually make some new highs and then pull back again. This opening gap reversal here was kind of funky, kind of messes up the charts a little bit. If we would pull back a little bit more deeply than this, okay, look at your HV, 167. So, and maybe I'm looking for a little bit too much perfection lately, but I don't want to... I don't want to bend the rules too much to chase what's happening now, especially now that volatility has begun to come off and is beginning to flatten out. And hopefully that makes sense. But on a volatile stock like this, I'd actually would have preferred a deeper retracement before going after it. But I hear you, you have a bit of a knockout move and then your entry would have been right around this high, okay? I'm guessing you're already long, James. <laughs> Yeah, if you're long, stay long. It looks pretty good, okay? AUDC. Audio codes. Starting to look interesting after gap up breakout. Yeah, yeah, well, let's let's wait for a pullback. I mean, this thing has gone, has tripled over a short period of time. It's kind of all over the place, but shoot, everything's all over the place. So maybe on a pullback. Now, the only thing that's kind of strange is that let's say the market does start really going up, then the stocks that led us out of this mess, like I said earlier, might not be the stocks that continue to lead us. But yeah, as a trend follower, let's see what it looks like when it pulls back. It's broken out fairly nicely, but it, by the time you get the pullback, you could be back into this little range here. So let's just see how it happens. So for sure, have that on your watch list, okay? But let's wait for the pullback and then like Justice Powder Stewart, as we often say, we'll know when we see it. SDGR recent biotech started to climb back towards highs. So yeah, put this on your watch list for sure. I'm trying to think if I played this one or not. This one looks really familiar. Does anybody remember if we played this back here? I think I did, and I think I did incredibly well and felt smug, and then it came right back in. <laughs> so um, if you are playing maybe a secondary breakout, again, I'm not a, a breakout player, but in IPOs, I'm willing to play breakouts like we had back here, okay, with a few caveats. One of them being I like, if it's a higher price IPO, I like to have some Landry light on 
a five day moving average. So right here you have Landry light and you have a new closing high. Okay. So that's, and again, I don't remember whether I played this one or not, but that was a setup back then. Now I would almost, I think you'd be better off letting it break out and then look to play the first pullback. I did play it. Thank you. Okay. I thought I recognized that one. You see, here's, you know, <laughs> it's a, this is a perverse thing about this business. I was all excited because I played this stock and made 10, 15 points or whatever, took some partial profits, and then it came right back in, and then whatever's left on the table evaporates. Net, net, I did really well, okay? But I find myself mad at myself because this thing didn't continue higher. But, you know, it's kind of like what I tell my clients. Well, you gave up money on the end of the trade, but you made money overall, so why don't you send me that money so you could feel better? Well, guess what? I have the same exact feelings i still have a pulse and you know it, it, the reason i feel that way because it's human nature but the reason i get so mad at these gurus out there making it look easy and they're fos we all know that but anyway i think the reason i get so angry is because it's disingenuous to the person who's out here in the trenches grinding it out like what's wrong with me you know <laughs> But look at that. And, and there's actually some psychological reasoning behind it, some neurology behind it too. A negative observation, as we often talk about, is twice has twice the emotional impact as a positive one. So here's a stock. I don't get excited when I see it, or I don't have a feel good when I see it, because I know I lost money on the second half of the trade, even though I made money overall, right? So yeah, that's. So let, let that break out and let's play the first pullback on that, okay? The Qs have retraced the FIB of 786. I don't know if 786 is a legitimate FIB. I think the 786 is like a, um, and believe me, I'm not a FIB guy. 786 is like a square root of something. And it's like, they just kind of pulled that out the air or from somewhere else. <laughs> so, but yeah, look at these Qs. Um, let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. All right. So the Qs, I could see, I think I have 618 on this uh, chart. So, yeah, I'll take your word for that, that it's um, gotten past the uh, retracement on that. So we'll see. And that's, that's a boy, is that a textbook V shaped recovery, huh? Crazy. Amazing. So here's a stock that's sort of all over the place longer term as you can see it's a jackie mason stock it's up it's down it's up it's down but as i often say the personality of a stock can change there are some chip makers right now that are doing really well i saw a presentation from linda rasky she said her brother works on intel and the reason some of these semiconductor stocks are doing so well is they can't keep up with the demand for laptops because a lot of these work at home people now don't really have adequate equipment to work at home and so their companies are pushing out the equipment now i don't know what these people do it says packaging well maybe it's some kind of packaging that people need based on this thing that's happening i can't say what the name of it is because youtube will demonetize me kick me off so it looks okay if i was just seeing the chart from from this part forward, okay, and not seeing all this, I would be more excited about it. And what I like about it in more recent times is that it has persisted higher, but it has that V-shaped recovery, okay? So I say it looks okay. I think you could certainly do much worse, okay? But I'm just having a hard time getting excited about it. But yeah, I agree with you as far as it looks like an okay setup. Nothing wrong with that. BHAT. I'm not a big fan of bats right now, but let's see. Well, obviously a lower priced stock. It does. It is an IPO. The first thing I'm seeing is okay. It's a die and a die IPO. Now, sometimes IPOs come public, die out, get their act together, and then begin to rally. Second thing I'm seeing is a mound of overhead supply. But hey, so what if I buy this stock at a buck and change and it goes to two bucks and change before it hits any trouble? Then maybe 
I'm not going to worry too much about that. Let's put the bow ties in. You do have a bow tie. I think it looks okay. I think it's super speculative at a dollar and change. Also, look at your average volume, 140,000, and that's just for <laughs> that's for a hundred a dollar stock or whatever dollar and change stock. So, <laughs> you know, one trader could easily be the all the volume for one day okay so i think it's too thin to go after too cheap to go after but i hear you it doesn't look um it doesn't look bad a few caveats aside so yeah just be be careful in that one hca it's going to be a healthcare stock hca dave here we go now here we this is another one of those big picture retrace patterns and the methodology isn't always the be all end all right so if we're looking at like a let's see is that a weekly let's look at like a two day three day okay let's go back to one day chart so here's a stock that fell out of bed with everything else fell out of bed look at that huh. <laughs> it's a hospital stock that fell out of bed <laughs> that mattress stock has been firm my pillow has been firm airline stocks have been well, i don't want to say that that's, that's, that's that sounds stupid uh, it has a big picture retrace look to it, okay? So long or short, I would be shorting this stock, okay? Uh, would it, am I going to short it? No. I think that I'm just going to let these big picture retrace stocks, for the most part, as a general statement, okay, check back off them. But I think I'm just going to let these guys run their course and not go after them. But, yeah, if we're looking at maybe let's a two-day, three-day, four-day, Maybe a little bit longer term chart, you could you could sort of see where, okay, this stock is in trouble. I'd bet you 20 bucks that it is a bow tie. Look at that, it's a weekly bow tie to the downside. So I think the stock is still in trouble. I don't think it's worth going after as a short, but if you are short, then by all means, stay short, okay? All right, any more? Good picks this week, by the way. Okay, while we're in an impasse, I wanna thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, you can shoot me an email at dave at davelandry.com or go to davelandry.com slash contact, better yet. We don't talk to you now and then. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. You're welcome, Zach. And stay safe and stay sane. And may the trend be with you.